Textsen, som du sikkert har fanget to eller fire eller tre eller hvad det er. Uh, not Revolution, der er noget, du går ikke fra en eller går ikke fra det kongen til, til den anden går til. For det første side, så har du her Edward Arrow, for det første side er Nero, fra Nero de la Gladio, for det første også de borde lande, og det første er Mario Pinto, som er kun indikat i gamle other part som er der problem man ikke har den her så nevertheless some brief introduction to outlier detection some definitions I found in literature so a very classic definition from the 80s Hawkins the intuitive definition of an outlier would be an observation which deviates so much from the other observations as to arouse suspicions that it was generated by a different mechanism. An even earlier definition by groups, was mostly working on uh, univariate data in that time, an outlying observation or outlier is one that appears to deviate markedly from other members of the sample in which it occurs. And from a textbook, Barnett Lewis, an observation or subset of, of observations which appears to be inconsistent with the remainder of the data set. And there are some interesting observations in here. So, for example, we have deviation mentioned in here, and deviate, and inconsistent. So, they somehow don't fit, they deviate from the remainder of the data set. The other part that is reoccurring is this observation of the remainder, the other observations, the other members of the sample. So these very classic definitions of outlier, they are all based on the idea of deviating from the remainder. And another word, mentioning word in here, is the different mechanism. So it's not just an unusual value. When people think of outliers and very new to the domain, coming from statistics, then they have in picture in mind of a Gaussian distribution and there are these outliers that are on the long tail of the distribution going beyond three sigma. But actually these points are still coming from the same normal distribution. They are just less frequent. But um, what we are more interested in is not so much detecting an unusually large value. What we are interested in is detecting a different mechanism. So is there a point that probably is caused by something else? And then we can further dig into this and to figure out what is actually causing this. Why is this point unusual? It could be that it is just a rare case coming from the same cause. But it could also indicate that there is a different cause. And Hawkins in the 80s, when he had that definition, he had a very um, classic example also. So we're talking about mechanisms here, something that is generating the data. And when, if we are looking at learning and statistical inference, there's always something that we need to model this, yeah, the way the data was generated as some probabilistic process, and then we can talk about how usual or unusual the values are. And outliers are abnormal data that have a suspiciously low probability. And if you move to this kind of more formal de definition, then we can eventually also talk about um, the three sigma outliers that we had in univariate data. So that's point where the model that we have does not fit 
it does not explain these points very well. And on some data sets, that is very easy to do if you have one univariate data and it's nicely behaved. So on the right hand side, there is height of um, 25,000 people as a histogram in this case. That's the, the orange lines, it's a bar chart. And once we um, model this data, we can see there is a reasonably good fit possible with a Gaussian distribution to this data. And so while we do know that the long tail on the left hand side eventually will cross zero and I've never seen someone with a negative height. That is impossible. So one may argue that this cannot be a Gaussian. It at least needs to be like a um, log normal or something like that with a very low skewness. But nevertheless, um, it works well enough for testing. So we can model the data using a Gaussian distribution and then if we have some point, let's say somewhere here, and we have an adult that is less than one meter fifty or so, then we can argue that he is unusually small. Of course, this depends on where exactly the data was um, collected. That data is probably from military conscriptions or something like that, so it's probably males in the US or so. So um, it may have depend a lot on how I sample the data. Now, there is a, here's a classic court case from the US in the uh, 1949, Hadlum versus Hadlum. You can see the two opponents have the same family name. And the, there was a case where Mrs. Hadlum bore a child 349 days after her husband had left for military service. And now he claims that this is not his child. But his wife claims it is. That it is just unusual. And well, we know that the average human gestation period is around 280 days. So 40 weeks, that's always the rule of thumb that you use. And we have data, and we already back then, they had data on the usual time. And then one can argue, okay, this is a typical value, 40 weeks, but you can see there is quite some values larger, and there are quite some values smaller. And that's weeks. So it is not that unusual to take two weeks longer or two weeks less than that 40. But here, this case is in week 50. And week 50 at that time was considered possible, but very unlikely. So um, there was kind of a fight. Uh, this court case probably didn't have to, uh, gene analysis at that time. Today in the US, they would probably insist on test, and that would settle this quite quickly. So um, how do we decide statistically on whether this is plausible or not, or what is more likely? One may argue that there should be some, some threshold, and if it's the difference between the two assumptions of the two opponents are extremely different in their probability, the likelihood, then maybe one is, the, is wrong. So we can model this data. Now, instead of the old chart, I used the data and made a new chart. So we can fit to this data a Gaussian model. This will be the blue line. So that's the fitted model. And then we can look for an alternative assumption. And there's the alternative assumption that is indicated by um, this different uh, labeling on the top x-axis that it is shifted by 10 weeks so that the, the child was uh, created, whatever, um, I'm not sure what the right English word is, um, 10 weeks later after he had left for military service. And we can see that this would explain the observation, of course, much better. 
but in the end it's a single observation. So, um, yeah. One can argue, and I believe at that time he actually lost, and it was considered to be his child. So that is a very classic approach to outlier detection, and one could argue this is an outlier in the natural uh, length of um, gestation. Or one could argue, well, it's indicating a different mechanism. So what is outlier detection? Outlier detection is the identification of unusual data in large databases. Not just looking at 10 samples, we can do that by hand kind of, but if you have thousands, 10,000s, 100,000s of objects, then it becomes interesting to do this with an algorithm. Without previous knowledge, we want to do this unsupervised. We don't want to use labeled data, then it would be an unbalanced classification task. Of course, these exist. And here we also assume that the outliers are already in the data. So there's also the notion of like change detection, where I'm modeling the existing data and assuming that is normal, and then trying to check if there's something new coming. Usually in outlier detection, we don't assume this. And we assume that we do not have a full statistical model of the data. So in the previous example, we modeled it as a Gaussian distribution, and we assumed all the data is coming from this Gaussian. That is what I would consider a full statistical model of the data, and in most of the cases in outlier detection, we assume that this is not feasible to completely model the data this way. Now an outlier could simply be a measurement error. So maybe they noted the wrong birth date. And if the child was actually born two months earlier, then everything should be fine. So that could be happen, could happen. In this case, it's probably very unlikely. Then um, some is correct, but unusual data. That's the case of Mrs. Hadlow. Sometimes these outliers are the interesting objects. So if you're in network intrusion detection, you're not so much interested in normal traffic. You're looking for attacks, and that's unusual attacks, that's the interesting part. A usual attack with an SSH scanner that tries poor passwords is not a threat if you have a um, secure login. And sometimes these t outliers are only temporary, volatile. So something may be unusual for some time and then become usual. And we have this type of change. And we must accept that most of the time this will not be a completely automatic process because there will be many objects of the tape correct but unusual. So we need to analyze them afterwards to learn more about the data. And because of that, I consider it to be part of exploratory data analysis. There's some differences in the different terms that you have. So if you think back of clustering, the DB scan outlier method, it would produce objects called noise. And sometimes people assume that this noise is outliers. And yes, many outliers will end up in noise but the converse is not necessarily true. If, depending on how to, I choose the parameters, everything can be noise. So does it really devi deviate from the normal? Definitely not all of them. So uh, the idea of DB scan was really noise object is like background, background density. These things exist, but I'm not interested in them. So if there are too few objects, I can ignore that part. Notion of density coming into play. That does not make all of these objects outliers. They're just below an interestingness threshold. So noise, even though um, less frequent than the, the clusters that I'm looking for, can be very common. So if you're looking for radio signals, there is this background noise, 
but it's probably not interesting. It's not um, outliers all the time. But if there's no signal, then you measure background noise, and that is normal. And the clustering methods, they tend to have not a very high precision on this type of objects. They are focused on finding typical patterns. And of course, some, if they discard some objects as not typical, then they probably are not that typical, but they are not designed to detect this. So they tend to work worse than, than op the actual outlier detection methods. In some, the, these ideas are, of course, combined. And even removing noise can help the clustering algorithms. So single linkage clustering, for example, was kind of sensitive to um, this chaining effect if I have these points in between my clusters. And if I remove noise, this probably is occurring less frequent and I get better clusters with a simpler clustering algorithm. So it is interesting to even try this before clustering and then check how the clustering is affected. So outliers from that definition that we had are also somewhat supposed to be interesting and novel. So it's not just errors that we want to discard. We, we want sometimes to discard errors to improve the quality of the results. Then it's interesting to find the outliers, to remove them. But in some cases, we can remove much more than this. So if you think of a truncated mean, I can often quite blindly remove the top 10% and to lowest 10% of my data, compute the mean on the remaining 80%, and I have a more robust estimate that is still very precise if I have clean data. So it's about somewhat being interesting and novel, but that is hard to judge for the computer. In particular, if I don't have labeled data. If I would do the supervised and annotate the data, then I can, of course, learn somewhat what the user considered to be interesting before and hope that this notion does not change. But here, in unsupervised context, I don't have such a label, and there is no mathematical definition of what is interesting to the user. So novelty is a bit more formalizable, kind of deviating from what I've seen before, but that is pretty much a definition of outlier that we so far have. Novelty can wear off, that's an interesting part, so that's why there exist several streaming methods and, yeah, this type of change detection. So we can apply this in many cases. I think um, Professor Müller mentioned some of them already. It is very commonly mentioned that there's the idea of fraud detection, although I would usually prefer a supervised method for this. So if you ha buy with your credit card, there is probably some algorithm running in the background that checks if this buying behavior fits to how you used the card before. So you, if you use it to buy food in the Mensa, the system will probably say, yeah, that's fine, I've seen this before. And if you then five minutes later order some expensive iPhone in Nigeria, then the credit card warning system will probably say, wait, so um, that, that is very common, but um, in many cases, I'd try a supervised approach first than um, one of these methods just because of reliability. There was the first time you went to Mensa and bought uh, food there with unusually small um, value probably. So that was an unusual data point at that time, and it should not have triggered. Then in medicine, so we may have unusual symptoms, you may have unusual reactions compared to similar cases. And that is always also interesting. If you think of the vaccinations to um, corona, for example, there's always a lot of this discussion. Are there unusual reactions to the vaccination? Then we have the long COVID issue, but long COVID is not that rare. <laughs> so it's probably not an outlier anymore. So, um, but that's, it's interesting to, to keep an eye on unusual reactions to medicine, in, to medical things, and then if this happens, 
to try to notice this and react briefly. So a few years ago, I think there was this um, influenza vaccination. There was a cluster of cases and I, I quickly put a hold on this vaccination. So um, that can always happen if you work with eggs and that. So intrusion detections, so defending against cyber attacks that can manifest itself in a node that exhibits an unusual communication pattern. And you could try to monitor your systems for usual and unusual network traffic, and if that happens, maybe automatically block that node and affect that node or raise an alert. And that sometimes should probably be used more to detect some of the um, Torian attacks that we've seen a lot that encrypt Windows systems. So um, in these cases, it may well be possible to do this if there's a node accessing directories that it usually does not, then maybe it's trying to find files to encrypt, for example. So, or communication patterns, a, no a node that begins scanning for open uh, ports in the, in the network is probably compromised. But you never know what is causing this. So back when I was studying, I think my laptop at some point uh, triggered the uh, warning system from um, the network's operating system there. And, but only like a standard warning that would block you for 15 minutes. Um, but then Skype was uh, also very frequently triggering this, triggering this for good reason. And the, the reason was not that anything was compromised, but I loaded some website that had a comment system and all the people in the comment system had avatars, but they were not loaded via a single connection, but were a whole bunch of connections. And so they, they thought my browser was attacking the website, but it was just the images loading. Yeah, so these things um, happen and that's why they're difficult to use. You don't want to um, block legit users. Then pre-processing. You should all have seen that in, if you work with real data, real data is dirty. There is always some issue that you need to manually fix, that you need to write scripts to modify the data, to clean it up. So maybe these type of methods can help detecting errors in the data, cleaning them. Then you can maybe mask the extreme values and better understand your data. So also a brief story, colleagues were building a database for um, archaeologists to analyze the data and they, they were collecting data on bone fragments found in, at excavation sites. And when analyzing the data, they found an, a very unusual peak. And it turned out there was a big peak at a length of 99 centimeters for bones. And they said, wait, this can't be right. So they talked to the domain experts and it turned out that 99 as length was simply the code they used to indicate a broken bone where you cannot measure the links. So it's good to, to try these things on, on data and check if there is such an anomaly in there. So it's, it's important to use these things also to detect if you are operating systems that maybe they degrade over time and maybe the device needs to be recalibrated if you notice that the measurement errors increase and increase and increase that should eventually cause a, a warning. But you may also observe an unusual result. And maybe that is interesting. Yeah, something new happening. If you're working in particle physics, maybe you are observing an unusual particle. So that's the uh, variation of this, uh, of a very classic saying, used to be one man's poison is uh, another man's medicine or the other way around, one man's noise is another man's signal. So someone may be interested in just discarding this data and may not consider it interesting, but to someone else, these points may be exactly the ones that are of interest. So don't treat outliers as something just worth for discarding. We can do outlier detection in different scenarios. I already mentioned that we can do a, like a supervised version, 
So we have labeled training data, and usually we would assume there are multiple classes of normal data, and there might also be different kinds of outliers. So for example, in intrusion detection, you may have labeled data with different type of normal behavior and different types of attacks. And the problem usually then is that this data is highly unbalanced. And many classification algorithms don't handle this very well. So you need to weight the rare objects higher and try different techniques to make them more important. Use a cost-based um, scoring system instead of the standard accuracy because if 99 of your data is easy, you get 99% accuracy just by saying everything is normal. So you need kind of to adjust for this. But in this part of the lecture, we won't go further into detail on this. We can do this in a semi-supervised way. So for example, labeled data may only be available for normal data. It could also be available only for part of the data in the above case. And if we have data for which we know that it is clean, that it is normal data, then we can consider this to be a one-class classification approach. So we have one class of training, and we want to predict whether a new object belongs to this class or not. But we don't actually have training data for that second class. And the scenario that we will be looking into in this lectures is the unsupervised scenario. So we have no training data. We have only kind of our te test data set. And not yet, maybe. Maybe we want to label it, but then we need to find out which objects to study. And in, we assume that the data is dirty. So there are outliers in my data. I just don't know which objects. So that's what we will be working on. <clears throat> 